Well, welcome to you. Welcome to the Stephen Mansfield podcast and welcome to the Great Man podcast. I'm doing one video for both this week and let me tell you why. I want to talk to you about the pilgrims. I want to talk to you about that first Thanksgiving story. It's an important one in our national history. It's a sweet one to people of faith. It's a little sentimental to me and it's one that's embattled in our generation. And so I want to talk about it. I want to unpack a little bit of the opposition to it, those who are claiming it's myth and false, um, and show you a little bit about how some of our more noble stories from our history are being attacked and undermined. And then I hope that you'll take this story, repeat elements of it to the next generation around Thanksgiving, and perhaps it will enhance your Thanksgiving experience. I think it's an important part of our lore and our heritage. So the whole Thanksgiving story, the first Thanksgiving story, the story of the pilgrims, uh, begins in the north of England with a congregation. They weren't happy with the Church of England, felt like it was filled with compromised, uh, compromised. and so they, they lived in a town called Scrooby, England. Some of my students in, in times past have written Scooby-Doo, England. No, Scrooby. So uh, finally they, they got, as it was said at the time, harried out of the country. They had to leave the country, and so they went to live in Holland in a town called Leiden. Very, very difficult for them. This was six, uh, 1612. And uh, there they were in a country with needs of labor for labor that were different than in England. Many people who'd been postmasters now were working on dairy farms and they were building dikes and working in shipping and things like that. They knew nothing about. Very hard. The older ones died early. The younger ones moved away from their faith a bit. Uh, it, was a, it was a tough time. But we have their journals, we have their writings, and they began to pray for the natives of the new world they were hearing about. They were aware there was a people across the ocean who did not know Jesus. And so they were concerned about that and prayed about that and asked that they might be but a stepping stone, these are their words, but a stepping stone of the light of Christ. Well, finally, through a number of uh, rentals and purchases and business deals and what have you, they finally decided to sail in 1620 to the new world. Without getting into too much of the detail, they, they, they messed up. They had two ships. One began to take on water as soon as they left Southampton, England. So they ended up having to put most of the people from that ship onto the Mayflower. So the Mayflower was packed. They were leaving too late in the year. Uh, they didn't quite have the right provisions. They didn't know what it was going to be like when they got to the New World. And so they sailed. Now, th this voyage was unbelievably difficult. You need to know that what we now call the United States was going through what historians call a mini ice age. And it was very, very cold. Uh, the Atlantic at that time, the U.S. Navy says that the normal time in the Atlantic uh, during that period of, of sailing, uh, the water is so cold that you die if you fall into it for three minutes. Now that water is spraying on them. It's coming through the sides of the ships. It's floating around in the bottom. They sailed for 66 days. The sailors called them psalm singing puke stockings because those were the two things they spent most of their time doing, singing psalms and throwing up. It was a pretty miserable voyage. Just picture that they're locked in the tween deck for months at a time. Uh, they are all kinds of human refuse floating in the bottom. I mean, it's a nasty experience. And finally, they arrive at Cape Cod. Now they're 500 miles off course. So they start exploring a little bit where they might land before they land, they realize that they've got, to, they've got to write some kind of instrument to govern themselves. And so they write a thing we now know as the Mayflower Compact. It's one of the first civil compacts in American history. And in it is this line, we sailed for the glory of God and the advancement of the Christian faith. We sailed for the glory of God and the advancement of the Christian faith. They said they also bound themselves together in a civil body politic uh, in other words, they were out of the region that they had been given a charter for. They needed to have some instrument, some constitution, some covenant that bound them together for political purposes, for governmental purposes. And that's what they signed. The Mayflower Compact, really, really important. We sailed for the glory of God, the advancement of the Christian faith. Well, finally, they go ashore. They start to build their houses. It's bitterly cold. Um, they're desperate. They know it's late. They know they can't plant. It's too cold to plant. It's going to be a rough winter. And... All of a sudden, they've, they've, seen, they've seen natives off in the distance and the edges of the trees and the forest. But all of a sudden, uh, a, a, a big old Indian strides out. They aren't used to people this size. They were smaller people. This guy's 6'3", six, 6'4", six, we think. Uh, big, tall, a little underdressed for the weather because the natives there were used to the, to the cold. He walks out, walks up to the guy that he thinks is in charge, and he says, Hi, do you have a beer? Now... I know you're going to laugh and think that I'm making that up. I'm not. Uh, this was Samoset. 
uh, Sam Mosset had sailed around with English sea captains, had even been in England, some people say, um, learned English, and obviously developed a taste for English beer. And he was trying to say something friendly. He was trying to say, let's be friends. And the way he did it was to say, let's have a beer. I'd like to see Budweiser or somebody do that commercial. But you understand that this was his attempt to make friends. The backstory is that the natives in that area had been largely killed off by diseases that had come from English sea captains and earlier voyages over the previous decade. So this basically was a band of Indians looking for people to be with. Sam Osset introduced them to Squanto, the famous Squanto, and the two of them taught the, the people we now call the pilgrims the way to farm, the way to harvest the sea. And they attested later that had it not been for Sam Osset and Squanto, they would not have survived. They simply would not have survived. He was, as William Bradford said, a special token of God's grace uh, to help them to survive. Now, we come to this, this issue of the first Thanksgiving. What had happened was that they had a horrible winter. Well, more than half died. Every family had deaths in their family, uh, a horrible time. It got down to where each person was given five kernels of corn rationing and some brackish water. It was terrible. So now we're in 1621. They decide to do some different farming methods. They had done communal plots that didn't work well. Uh, they decided to give each family its own plot of land and let them work for their own, their own benefit so to speak, as well as the communities. Um, this, of course, has taken on a symbolic nature in American history of, of you know, moving from communist or communal uh, farming to individualized plots or private property. And they had a very, very bountiful harvest. So by the fall, Governor Bradford declared a day of Thanksgiving. Uh, they decided to invite their native friends who had helped them so much. Um, it's, it doesn't look like, uh, you know, people... We sometimes see these paintings of natives and um, England or English sitting down at this massive carved table, you know, that looks something like a large New England uh, Thanksgiving celebration today. It's not like that. I'm sure they sat on the ground. I'm sure they sat on blankets. I'm sure they stood around and ate. It was really rude and informal. But the natives brought venison. They killed five deer and brought venison. The women had uh, already, uh, seafood would have been the main uh, diet, the made food at that time because they harvested the sea. Uh, some kind of fowl was there, probably turkey, that's probably not a myth, and uh, lots of pies, meat pies, uh, vegetable pies, things of that nature. We're not sure about the pumpkins. Um, but the Indians did introduce them to popcorn. So the popcorn you're likely to watch during the football game on Thanksgiving Day, you're in the right place. So this was the first Thanksgiving, and it was a time of celebration for God's goodness. Now, that's the basic overview of this story, and you can read it yourself in William Bradford's Of Plymouth Plantation or other books about this story. Um, it seems like a fairly innocent story. It seems like one we'd want to cherish. I can understand certainly why we remembered a day of Thanksgiving. Lincoln called for it during the Civil War. Uh, President Franklin Roosevelt established it as a national holiday. And of course, it got adjusted a little bit as to the day of the month, etc. But it's a, it's, a, it's a cherished and wonderful day to remember our Christian faith and its influence in America. Uh, to remember those who suffered horribly, horribly, um, to lay a foundation for this new land, to remember a vision to help the natives of this land, something we've not done very well or very much in this country. Um, I think this story helps us remember those values and those early intentions. Uh, it's something that I hope you'll pass on to the next generation and tell. In fact, in New England, they have a habit of uh, a tradition of taking five kernels of corn and putting it on every plate before the Thanksgiving meal is eaten and the table's groaning with food. They put five kernels of corn on there and pause and remember and say a prayer just to remember the starving time. So in my next episode, which will come again before this Thanksgiving in 2020 and what a year it's been, uh, I want to tell you how this story is being debunked and uh, undermined. Uh, again, it seems like an innocent thing we would cherish, but for those who don't like our Christian heritage, for those who don't want to believe that we had noble forebears, etc., um, there's, there's an attempt to undermine this story. I'd like for us to hang on to it. I'd like for us to cherish it. I'd like for us to pass it on to the next generation. I think it's something sweet and noble about our history. So in our next episode, I'm going to talk about the attack, the assault, the vicious war on the Thanksgiving story. Back to you soon.